possible uh, for the evening. Uh, the proceedings will go as is usual in the forum. For those of you who may not have been here before, a word about what it is that is usual. Uh, each of the panelists will have eight to ten minutes to make a statement. I will do my best to hold them strictly to that uh, time limit. That will be the only time when I will be deliberately insulting is if they overstep that time. Uh, following the introductory uh, statements, uh, the floor will be open for questions and discussion and so on. Now, the management earnestly requests that anyone who wishes to discuss anything step up to one of the microphones of which there is one right there, and I am told that there are some on the upper levels. Uh, and if you at any point feel moved to make a remark, spot the microphone nearest to you uh, and go toward it and then gesticulate so that I can see that you're there, and I will do my best to recognize you in some reasonably fair uh, kind of an order. It is essential that you be at a microphone because this is being taped for eventual rebroadcasting on WGBH, and if you are not near a microphone, you will not be heard. So this is not a Mickey Mouse requirement. It is an essential requirement, so please cooperate in that matter, even if you are shy of microphones. Uh, with that administrative detail uh, behind us, I would like to introduce our first uh, panelist, who is uh, Jeffrey Blumenfeld. Uh, Mr. Blumenfeld was for a time the attorney in charge of the Justice Department's antitrust case and so bears some responsibility for divestiture. Since then, he has left government service and founded a law firm, Blumenfeld and Cohen, which specializes in antitrust, telecommunications, and litigation. It would seem to me that if you specialize in antitrust and telecommunications, <laughs> litigation goes without saying but uh, he sees fit to mention that as a special point. Perhaps he will tell us why. Jeff, you've got eight to 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, most of my friends would be amused at that because they say that I can't introduce myself to someone at a party in less than eight to 10 minutes, but I'm going to try tonight. I was asked to speak uh, uh, on virtually whatever topic came to mind that had to do with uh, one year after divestiture, but especially to mention any surprises anything unexpected that has come about as a result of divestiture. I suppose that for me the most unexpected, most surprising thing is the uh, level of hostilities which my friends have been able to maintain over the last year. I had thought that after a few months they would recover their usual good humor. Uh, but their hostility I think reflects what has in fact been the greatest surprise of divestiture, which is the extent to which uh, the population as a whole uh, finds the degree of freedom of choice that the vesture has brought about unsettling. And as I've always thought of uh, this as a country which prided itself as having as an ideal form of organization Jeffersonian democracy, and yet when faced perhaps too suddenly with having a great deal of choice in an area where formerly there had been virtually none, people have become very upset. They regard it as evil. Uh, to be forced to make difficult, difficult decisions, such as what long-distance company to use. Should they buy a phone or continue to lease one? Should they go to the official phone store or should they go to their local drug store? I am very surprised that anyone finds these choices bewildering, unsettling, uh, or upsetting. It seems to me that that's the essence of the way in which our economy is designed to operate, is to have so much choice that it is, in fact, bewildering. That's what uh, a free enterprise economy is about. Nobody has ever said it, that it's bewildering to be able to choose among all the various cars. Should I buy domestic? Should I buy foreign? Should I buy front wheel drive? Should I buy rear wheel drive? You don't see anyone writing editorials complaining about the freedom of choice in the automotive marketplace. So I have found it very surprising that people have reacted that way. One of the things that, uh, one of the possible explanations of it uh, comes really from my days as a uh, when my main interests were criminal law and criminology, where I did a great deal of reading in what was known as the institutionalized personality. And that was a study of the fact that when someone had been institutionalized, and that could mean prison or military service or in some other closed society where the choices were essentially made for you, what to wear, when to get up, what to do with your day, what to eat, that people when suddenly released into a situation where they had total free choice, 
were bewildered and upset by it, could not deal with the level of choice available to them so suddenly. And perhaps that explains a little bit about what's going on uh, in our reaction to divestiture. Other than that, virtually nothing that has happened has been particularly surprising. That is, uh, there has been some level of chaos. Uh, there has been some level of uh, what, what people call a shakeout period. That seems to me to be not only inevitable, but desirable. That's what a competitive economy gives you. Uh, look at, for instance, microcomputer industry, one of the most competitive in this country. People are constantly talking about companies going under by the score, which they are. But there are also new companies starting up by the score in the microcomputer industry. That is what a healthy and a, what a competitive economy looks like. It's people entering and people leaving the marketplace as they respond to the economic pressures of the marketplace. Not because somewhere uh, in the southern part of Manhattan, people are deciding what telephones everybody in the country should be using, no offense, but because people are deciding on their own. And by exercising their choice in the marketplace, they're either inviting manufacturers in or asking them to leave. One of the, thing, one of the other things that's been surprising is the extent to which people look at the events of divestiture and uh, look at anticipated rulings of Judge Green on the decree and have difficulty predicting how things are going to come out. Uh, it is not surprising to have the difficulty predicting, but it's surprising that people tend to look at this whole process as if it were an abstract economic experiment. That is, as if some uh, IO economists had sat down and said, well, let's try an experiment in telecommunications. That is not what happened at all. And if you look at, if you look at the events of the divestiture as if they were an abstract economic experiment, you will find it bewildering, and you will find yourself unable to predict at all how Judge Green will rule on a particular decree matter. The divestiture came about as the remedy to an antitrust case. It came about because the Justice Department sued AT&T years ago and tried the case in 1981 and demonstrated, we believe rather forcefully, uh, to Judge Green that AT&T had engaged in antitrust violations, in bad acts. It was not an abstract structural economic case that was presented to Judge Green. It was a straight traditional Section 2 behavioral case. Things happened, and we told Judge Green about them. That's what the AT&T case was when it was tried. And the divestiture, the consent decree, which was by and large the relief that the government had asked for uh, throughout the years that the case was being tried, was designed not as an abstract experiment, but as remedies to the very particular kinds of conduct that were being seen. The conduct was largely the fact that by virtue of their vertical integration, uh, the Bell system directed the operating companies in such a way that they forestalled competition because they had the leverage to do it. They had the local monopoly over people's access to the system for putting in uh, phones, for buying equipment for use in the network, and for allowing long-distance competitors to reach uh, their customers. Not because the operating companies themselves had any interest in doing that, because all of those potential competitors were, in fact, merely their customers. Rather, they did it because those potential competitors were competitors of its parent, competitors of AT&T and competitors of its sister affiliates, particularly Long Lines and Western Electric. So the divestiture was aimed at ending that incentive, at creating a situation in which the operating companies would act on their own incentives and therefore treat the competitive entrants as their customers and as potential competitive suppliers in the marketplace. That is what divestiture has brought about, in fact, and that's the reason for the confusion. But I would suggest that it's confusion which is healthy and not a confusion that should be looked at as something that is wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was well within time and uh, more than an introduction. I appreciate that. Our uh, next speaker uh, represents uh, the other side of that uh, epic litigation, uh, the American Telephone and Telegraph Company. Uh, Maury Tenenbaum uh, represents a bit of the future. Uh, the past pattern uh, for rising to the top ranks of the Bell system was to begin by climbing poles in East Gulch, uh, and having climbed to the height of the pole, rise further on the corporate ladder. Uh, Maury began with a PhD and came up through Bell Labs and the high-tech route and is currently uh, executive vice president 
with uh, responsibilities for a lot of the future financial, strategic, and every other kind of planning for the new AT&T. And whether he chooses to speak of the past or the present or the future is his choice. And I give you Maury Tenenbaum for eight to ten minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. I'm delighted to be here, particularly with uh, this group of uh, distinguished panelists. Uh, Jeff Blumenfeld uh, reminded me when we said hello a little bit earlier, the last time he and I spoke to each other, um, I was on the witness stand and he was the cross-examiner. Uh, but I believe in letting bygones be bygones. <laughs> yes. When um, uh, uh, Dr. Truhart invited me to this uh, forum and suggested we might talk about the effects of uh, divestiture one year uh, later, uh, that choice of topic really didn't surprise me very much. Uh, reviewing the first year of divestiture and speculating a bit about the second and the years beyond that has been rather popular entertainment, I discovered, the last, uh, uh, the last few months around the turn of the year. But I particularly welcome this opportunity to uh, meet with this particular group of uh, present and uh, future policy and opinion makers, because new and enlightened policies are absolutely required to capture the promise of the information age upon whose threshold we stand and who people like uh, Tony Ottinger uh, understand and articulate much better than, than I can. Uh, but it is one thing that is clear to me is that the policies that uh, work so well with the regulated monopoly uh, will not serve the competitive future, and yet to a large degree we still live with many of them. Well, how are we doing as a nation and uh, as an industry in making the transition from regulation to competition uh, and to the information age? Uh, clearly, I think we're still in a period of transition, but at the same time, uh, I truly believe that there are real signs of progress. Breaking up the Bell system was an undertaking of unparalleled proportions. The system was simply not designed to be taken apart. It was designed to operate as an integrated whole and thereby achieve the synergies of that integration. Uh, but it's been done and phone service has continued. Uh, when you pick up your telephone today, you get dial tone and you reach the number you dial with the same high certainty that, that we've grown accustomed to in this nation. The initial consumer confusion to which uh, uh, Jeff referred, and it's been real, the confusion about buying or leasing telephones, about the new formats of bills and what have you, uh, is, although uh, present still, uh, to a significant degree settling down. And while many of our customers do tell us that they liked it better the way it was, I think people are adjusting to the fact that one-stop shopping, end-to-end -end responsibility for telecommunications uh, is no longer with us. Some business customers, especially those who needed uh, new and change private line services, did suffer severe service degradations uh, during the first year after divestiture. Uh, setting up those special kinds of business services has always been one of the most complex things that, uh, we, that we do in the telephone industry. And this service provisioning process with all the coordination that it takes, which was designed to operate as an integrated whole, really didn't survive its separation into more than 20 pieces. Uh, soon after divestiture, a backlog of service orders piled up and the very best efforts of the Bell Telephone Companies and AT&T people across the country struggled with that problem throughout 1984. But those problems also have yielded to the massive effort that was applied to them, and that service is rapidly approaching more normal levels. During 1984, the cost of long-distance service dropped and the cost of local service rose. Now, that had been widely predicted, and it happened as the historical subsidy of local service by long-distance users began to be removed. From the viewpoint of investors, the old Bell system parts are worth more now than the whole was at the time of divestiture. The composite stock price of the eight pieces, AT&T and the seven regional companies, uh, increased about 15% during 1984, and the composite yield during this first year has been reported as about 25%. The regional companies all had a very good year from the viewpoint of their profitability. 
and their earnings were at or above projections, and their stocks performed strongly. AT&T had a much more difficult year, with per share earnings somewhat more than 30 percent below our projections. We'd expected a couple of difficult years, and that forecast, at least from where I sit, was much too accurate. However, the financial community during the past few months has begun to uh, show signs that it shares uh, our optimism uh, for the long-term future of AT&T. Now, while we can reasonably expect that much of the trauma of divestiture is behind us, 1985 will bring its own share of industry changes. And one of the most profound began in 1984, and that's the process known as equal access in which the Bell Telephone companies, the divested companies, are modifying their equipment in order to give all long-distance customers the opportunity to select the long-distance company who will carry their messages when they dial one plus the usual telephone number. Uh, that requirement was one of the conditions of the consent decree uh, to which uh, Jeff Blumenfeld um, mentioned. Today, in most places, only AT&T offers service with that simple dialing sequence and customers must dial several more digits if they use another carrier. As equal access is phased in, locality by locality, customers get a notice from their local telephone company encouraging them to contact and sign up with a long distance company of their choice. I think you're experiencing that process right now here in Cambridge uh, with some exchanges due to convert to equal access on April 1st. And I expect a number of you have received letters from New England Telephone and one or more long-distance companies uh, telling you all about that uh, probably several times over. Uh, this process began last July, and by year end of 1984, about 5% of the customers served by the local Bell Telephone companies were affected. By the end of 1985, over 50% will have equal access and will have been encouraged to decide again who they want their long-distance carrier to be. By September of 1986, some 70% will have been converted. And thus, the next 18 months or so, we'll see a major change in the industry. The underlying force behind much of this change is neither political, regulatory, nor other social change. It's technology, especially the technologies of microelectronics, photonics, and computers empowered by advanced software. These are in turn producing an explosion of advanced applications and reduced costs, which are fueling the growth of the information age to which I've referred. One evidence of this is that uh, in 1984, AT&T introduced more new and extended services and products than in the previous three years combined and our performance is not all that different from others in the business. Among the leading edge technological advances was a manufacturable microelectronic circuit that stores a million bits of information on a chip of silicon the size of a fingernail. In addition to, to, store, in addition to storing information, AT&T Bell Lab scientists recently set a new world's record for transmitting information. Two billion bits per second over 80 miles of glass fiber about the thickness of a human hair without amplification. That's comparable to sending the text of the 30 volume set of the Encyclopedia Britannica in about a second. Overall, the industry's transition to a fully competitive long distance business <coughs> has been launched, but there are still important steps <coughs> to be taken, Mr. Ottinger. <laughs> you have a couple of minutes in which to take Oh, that. I shall take less than that. <laughs> While there are over 400 long-distance competitors, the one upon which the largest number of customers still depends, AT&T, is still fully regulated, while its competitors are essentially unregulated. In addition, AT&T is required to maintain two separate corporations and two separate sales forces to serve its customers, while its competitors, such as, for example, IBM, can offer full integrated service to their customers, communications and data processing combined. Now, there are historical reasons for this anomaly, but while the reasons ended with divestiture, the anomalies did not. And this must be corrected if competition is to thrive and its benefits made available to all customers. 
So while we may be on the right track, we must move ahead. I think it was Will Rogers who said, even if you're on the right track, you get run over if you just sit there. It's time to get on with making sure that our policies and actions support the irreversible competitive path that the nation has chosen in its telecommunications and information age industries. Did I make it? Yep. Good. Thank you very much, Mark. In the uh, old days before Jeff and his folks did their work, uh, <laughs> there would have been trouble in introducing the next speaker because there would be those who say, ah, unfair again. You're given double time to the same organization. Uh, post divestiture, uh, there is little doubt uh, in the minds of anyone but the most conspiratorial that uh, in introducing a representative of the New England Telephone Company, one is now introducing someone from another organization. Uh, John Coleman uh, has been uh, with New England Tell as long as I've been at Harvard, which uh, is remarkable. Not that long. Oh, yeah, that long. <laughs> and uh, he is now one of their vice presidents and uh, will give us the view of divestiture one year down the road from the point of view of one of the operating companies. John? Thank you. New England, 1984, New England Telephone had a uh, successful year. It was a year of tremendous change uh, for employees, stockholders, <coughs> customers, and significant change, and we think we came through that pretty well. Uh, I think if you take a look at uh, some of the recent articles in the Globe editorial, Dan Rather, and uh, some of the prior speakers have commented on it, there seems to be a lot of concern as to what has divestiture brought us and it doesn't appear in many people's minds right now to be perhaps be uh, too welcome. I'd like to leave the point that it appears to be a wave of nostalgia, and uh, we have to move beyond that. And I'd like to make a comment uh, from uh, Bert Halperin, who is the current FCC Common Carrier Bureau Chief, and he tries to make the point recently when he said that one of the crucial questions that must be currently addressed by the FCC is the role of the local telephone companies. The box today has the successes to the Bell system, offering universal service, sometimes at rates that are non-compensatory. Yet at the same time, they're trying to live in a world of competitive access for high volume customers, and they want to stay on the cutting edge of technology. So the question of what arena they will live in by the year 2000 and how they relate to that arena must be addressed. If we don't have a philosophical view and a visionary approach, we face the prospect of ending up in the s with the same problems we encountered with the old Bell system over the past 10 years. And from that, I'd like to make a few points. Number one, the cause of divestiture, as was pointed out, was and remains to be primarily and totally technology. Technology has been changing dramatically since the 50s, especially in the 1960s. It will continue to change dramatically in the future. And I think we must take that approach that that will, it has been the cause of, of divestiture. And especially if we take that approach and we look at the future of the, of the regional or the operating holding companies. And I think it was as we look back and we say one year of divestiture, but the real history of, of technology and tele tele telecommunications is really almost 100 years. And when you take everything that's gone on in that last 100 years and you take a look at what happened, and especially what's happened in the last year, you can come up with some pretty good judgments that what you must do to protect the future and, and to protect the telecommunications system in the United States as you know it today. And with that, I'd like to make some things, or some comments rather, as to the future. First, technology shouldn't be policed. It's a narrow viewpoint and it leads to inefficiency. Secondly, competition's here to stay. Uh, don't try to ban it and don't try to stop it in our account. Any ban which would deny customers swift access to the products and services that they're entitled to is totally inefficient. Third, businesses now regulated should be given an equal opportunity to compete. What's that mean beyond the platitude? Well, I guess it means the opportunity to adjust in New England Telephone's position. The prices are prices that we offer right now so that they're based on actual costs. Average costs allow the competition to selectively enter low cost high margin markets and leave us with the high cost ones, many of which yield a net loss. Fourth, services for which competition exists today should be deregulated in a systematic manner. None of us were born yesterday and that would lead to a 
position, I guess, that says that deregulation in a systematic manner. There needs to be a framework for the transition from regulation to competition. I think it's a good sign that so many state commissions are, are today taking a close look at intralata, which in this case is within the 617 and the 413 area codes, and to have competition within that and the related issues that, that it applies to. Having said that, I think it's incumbent on regulators to bring some of the studies that are going on to a close so that we can move ahead uh, in, a, in an organized fashion. And if we don't, I think that we'll be customers and companies and regulators thrashing around the marketplace that with rules and regulation of 100 years ago. Specifically, I think that in the context of competition within the state boundaries, I'm recommending that competitive services such as toll service, watch service, private line services, Centrex services, say should be de-tariffed by each state. Two, Non-basic services, such as touchstone and custom calling features, should receive similar treatment. There are options to these today. They're non-essential, and today we have competitive alternatives which exist in the marketplace. Three, enriched services, such as packet switching and high-speed data transmission, also deserve relaxed regulation. Also, the operating companies face stiff competition here. The desire to reduce regulation for services in these three categories speaks directly, I think, to the role of state regulatory commissions, which in my view also includes the protection of customers in non-competitive markets. Well, I suppose there are some of you who would then say, what about the little guy? You've forgotten about universal service. By prohibiting intralater competition, wouldn't state commissions jeopardize universal service? Actually, it's the reverse, and it's sort of like a catch-22. Because market freedom is the best way to protect universal service. Ironically, if the cross-subsidies that, that have enabled universal service are not changed, they'll threaten its own continuation. The heart of the matter is that if the operating companies are not allowed to compete, they'll become shaky, and so will their commitment to universal service. So to reiterate, you can't keep, keep competitors out of the marketplace. You can't stop technological progress and the competition it brings. Today, if you look at just the marketplace in, in Massachusetts and surrounding states, competition is bringing inter-exchange carriers, real estate firms that are wiring buildings, teleports which siphon off traffic from the local networks, large companies building their own networks, and selling excess capacity to outsiders and cable companies. So I think the future is a combination of all of us working together. The system that was built under the Bell system was an excellent system. Change has taken place and we must move ahead. But the future is really a situation where regulators, both at the state level and at the federal level, and also all of the peace parts, the vendors, inter, inter exchange vendors, all of the, the parties to that process within the very few months and years ahead of us must get together to establish a framework to protect that system for the future. Thank you. Thank you. We are remarkably disciplined here, and I will keep up the pace. Our next speaker uh, is an economist by background, but nonetheless my friend. Uh, he has, over the years, uh, had a number of jobs in various real worlds, uh, including academe and government and uh, is currently the chairman of the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities. I give you Paul Levy. Thank you. <coughs> uh, first, I'd like to announce, for those of you who did not know this, that the fact that Abraham Lincoln was born 176 years ago today is not the only major um, item of historical interest. Uh, the other item of historical interest, which I'm sure is true because it was in the Boston Globe this morning, was that in 1877, on this day, Alexander Graham Bell's new invention, the telephone, was publicly demonstrated for the first time with a hookup between Boston and Salem, Massachusetts. So it is indeed appropriate that we are here. Um, at the time, the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities did not exist. That occurred uh, in 1911 or 1912 or so. Um, the issues that a state regulatory commission such as ours has to deal with um, 
certainly go to some of the economic efficiency points that have been raised tonight. I, I think uh, the term economic regulation has implicit within it the idea that you'd like to try and price services and regulate companies in a way that somehow reflects the economic value of the services being offered um, and prices those services in a non-discriminatory fashion. It seems to me that the major forces behind the consent decree and behind FCC actions in the last several months have been based on these concepts of economic efficiency, on the concept that, that the costs of various services should be the guide for pricing those services. But the job of regulators is not only economic efficiency, it's equity. Describe this as, as saying we, we may be quasi-judicial bodies, but we're also quasi-legislative bodies. We are creatures of the state and, and of the people. And one of our concerns, one of our real concerns is an equity concern. And I think this is just a matter of, of fairness. Um, you can't take a system that has existed for 30 years or 50 years, a system on which uh, on the basis of which people have made numerous choices in their homes, in their businesses, uh, in their telecommunications needs, and say that all of a sudden because technology has changed, the regulatory environment has to change and the pricing structure has to change. It's too simplistic to do that. It's not fair to do that. And if you do do that, I think you invite uh, political um, interference in the regulatory process that I think can be counterproductive to the overall scheme of things. I think the FCC's approach on the access charges, the manner in which they attempted to impose access charges, not the merits of the access charges, but the manner in which they attempted to, to impose access charges was a classic lesson in that, where guided by staff experts, ex experts, experts on economic efficiency, the FCC decided to do one thing, and very shortly thereafter were told by Congress, no way. I think regulators have to be sensitive to the political and social implications of the, their decisions. Major issue I see for telecommunications within the states is <coughs> at what speed do we move towards cost-based rates if we do move <coughs> in, in that direction, how fast and in what areas. Now this is complicated somewhat by not knowing what the costs are, as you can imagine, and by knowing that a great percentage of the costs in the telecommunications industries are common costs, and as any worthwhile economist will tell you, there's no good way to allocate common costs, at least one that you can support the next day after you've adopted it. I would suggest that the decisions the regulators make in moving towards cost-based rates are highly dependent on the actual degree of competition that is seen in the marketplace. And we should recognize that the degree of competition that is seen in the marketplace will vary from service to service and from geographic area to geographic area. And it's the job of the regulators to balance those equity concerns, those efficiency concerns in the light of very imperfect knowledge on their part and indeed on the part of the companies they're regulating as to the speed of technological change, the, uh, the extent of competition in those various marketplaces. It's not the first time regulators have to make decisions on the basis of imperfect knowledge. In, in fact, many would argue that we do it every day, um, but the stakes are very high here and so we're going to be very careful about how we proceed. One other issue I think that's very important for the state regulators to address is what is local service? Uh, what do you get for your $12 a month? Do you get a flat rate calling area of 10 square miles? Do you get countywide calling? Do you get something else? Should there be local measured service? If so, in what form? And I think um, this is an area that's going to be of particular importance now to the state commissions uh, who have gradually lost, lost jurisdiction in the, in the intercity market and uh, one that is going to be of great uh, social and uh, political importance within the state. I think um, although everybody on this table would probably say that they, be they believe in universal service. I probably think among the five of us, there are probably six or seven definitions of universal service that we, uh, we might support. And so I think it's the job of the, of the state regulators to, to pin that definition down a little bit and, and to provide uh, a sense to the public and to the regulated industries what we really mean by universal service uh, 
and, and how we're going to enforce that. And with that, I'll close. Well, thank you very much. Uh, your moderator is also a panelist, and so I will allocate myself a few minutes. But since I don't trust myself, would you, Paul, give me five and then call me back to my senses? Uh, you have had a view here <laughs> from uh, several blind men as to what the elephant looks like. Uh, I will now, in all humility, ascend Mount Olympus and uh, look down on the animal and tell you what he really looks like. One of the charming things about this panel is the diversity of views about how divestiture came about. Uh, this kind of you know, truth and beauty and retribution theory we hear, uh, the inexorability of technology, one thing or another. Uh, all of these are true to some extent. Uh, in the aggregate, we got to divestiture by our usual democratic processes, namely we bumbled into it, uh, often for the wrong reasons. Uh, and in most instances with a very poor understanding of either what anybody was doing or why they were doing it. The question of what has happened as a consequence uh, is an interesting one. Uh, I guess on balance it's probably okay uh, for the following reasons. And since we are in the university, let me use a, a, a homey analogy. Every once in a while we revise the curriculum. Uh, that is the academic equivalent of a corporate reorganization. Uh, you don't revise the curriculum because there is new truth in the new curriculum. It's, after all, another arbitrary selection out of all the infinity of things you could talk about in class, and uh, that's only a small part of all the things you don't know and can't talk about. And yet you fight like cats and dogs, and well, then there's a new curriculum, and it lasts for 10 years until somebody blasts out the other one. What's the point? You wake everybody up, uh, and they have to think again about what they were teaching. And I think the net effect of the divestiture has been to wake up a lot of folks, uh, both within the corporate entities that were divested and among the regulators. All concerned uh, have had to think through anew what they were doing and why they were doing it in a context of changed technology, changed political conditions, changed uh, economic conditions from the days X years ago, and one can get into a quarrel about when that was, when the system that was blown up last year was, uh, was instituted. And so on balance, waking everybody up was uh, probably a good thing. Now, just like curricula once established uh, tend to get obsolete, and after the 10th year of repeating the same lecture notes, you know, people wonder why they've come to class. Uh, so uh, nothing stays static, uh, and it is not at all clear that competition is here to stay. Uh, the present state of competition is only a recurring phenomenon. Uh, the last time around was, uh, well, we had monopoly from around 1876 uh, to roughly the turn of the century. Then we had competition, uh, well, for, for, for a period of 20 to 30 years. Then we had monopoly, and now we have some degree of competition again. And what you're looking at, technology is one factor, is also an, another set of factors that have to do with the desires for stability versus uh, a bit of favoritism here or there, or a little bit of averaging here or there, which are some of the political factors that Paul was talking about. And for a variety of reasons, for which I do not have time uh, to go into detail, uh, at the moment, the pro-competitive forces are in the ascendant. And it's sort of hard to tell if and when uh, the pro-monopoly or olig oligopoly or price averaging or cross-subsidization folks will once again assert themselves. But uh, there have been cycles before, and there is every indication that with some unpredictable periodicity, uh, the pendulum is uh, likely uh, to swing again. And from my standpoint, uh, what one is witnessing here is a, uh, another stage in an ongoing electoral, political, economic evolution. And given the fact that everybody had to wake up, uh, it's not a bad place uh, to be. Uh, having said that, and hoping that all of you are uh, still awake, uh, it is time. I'm, I'm all right, too. Huh? We are all so well behaved. May I ask the same of questioners from the floor? Uh, please approach your nearest uh, microphone and resist the temptation to make a long speech uh, that then has a pseudo question at the end. Ask a question. As far as the panelists are concerned, if you have 
some statement that you wish to make to other panelists that has nothing to do with the question, I am sure you will find some way of doing that. So uh, I will just be the judge of whether you've exceeded the bounds or not. Uh, would you please identify yourself, sort of name and affiliation or something, so we know who you are? My name is Carl Danner. I'm a PhD student here at the school. Um, Mr. Tannenbaum argued. Well, you're, come on, you're also. <laughs> I'm also a member of the Policy and Planning Division at the California Public Utilities Commission. That's right. Uh, <laughs> Go, go I, ahead, I have my horse back here if you want to let it into your building. Um, Mr. Tannenbaum argues strongly that the playing field is ripe for leveling, that AT&T communications should be deregulated now. Um, the FCC and most of the state commissions have yet to agree. My question for the other panelists is, do you agree? And if you don't, what specific developments or evidence would change your mind? Would you like, who would like to uh, I, well, uh, being on the extreme left, I'll, uh, I'll begin. I both agree and disagree. I think that the, the level and the pervasiveness of regulation has ceased to be entirely appropriate. However, I think that to say that uh, we look at the marketplace and we see that we have one eight-foot-tall, 900-pound gorilla and several newborn infants, and therefore we have a competitive marketplace, so no restraints are necessary, is also somewhat naive. Now, the difficulty is, is there such a thing as somewhat regulated, or is that like being somewhat pregnant? Are you either only regulated or only not? The FCC, I think, has managed to, managed to blunder into a, a process of uh, partial pregnancy. Um, they opened the docket, one of the usual miasmic geological dockets, into a broad-ranged inquiry into what are the facts of life and where is truth. And they said at the conclusion of that, they would decide whether to deregulate AT&T. Cleverly, in the interim, what they're doing is deregulating AT&T piecemeal as AT&T lobs in selective deregulation requests. At the end, I suspect, of about three years, the FCC is going to look around and say, well, that question's moot, isn't it? So let's close the long docket. I think that's wrong, because I think it winds up in the most dangerous possible position, allowing AT&T to cross-subsidize from its pockets of monopoly power with total freedom, and yet to price with total freedom in areas where, uh, where they can do the most damage. So I think that's the wrong approach. I think there should be some deregulation, but I think it has to be carefully thought through. I guess I would uh, be on the side that says that uh, AT&T uh, has been through the situation of regulation and is now faced uh, with competition, I suppose you could say degrees of competition. Uh, is it proper today to, to get rid of that total uh, degree of regulation? I don't know if it's today, but I would, I would argue that it should be relatively soon. Uh, that's supposed to be one of the benefits of divestiture, to have a free and open competition. And uh, I, would, I guess I would opt on the side that uh, AT&T has had those shackles for many years and, and deserves the right after what it's been through to uh, enter that marketplace unshackled. Murray and then Paul. Um, it's simply amazing. The uh, consent decree, uh, which was the construct of the Department of Justice, which was their solution to the question of monopoly, uh, which uh, removed the monopoly bottleneck uh, by divesting the local companies, uh, which cleared the track for free and open competition, um, agreed to reluctantly after a good deal of uh, litigation by uh, AT&T, um, according to uh, Jeff, is, uh, uh, who of course was uh, a major figure in the, uh, in the Department of Justice, uh, has in fact not broken the monopoly. The monopoly still exists. Uh, I, I find that extraordinary. The other thing I find really extraordinary is uh, the, uh, the focus uh, seems to be that um, uh, seems to be the focus between AT&T and, and the competition. Um, and I wonder where the, uh, c where the consumer is uh, in all of this. Um, the whole purpose of competition, as I understand it, uh, is to provide benefit to the public, to the, to the user, to the user of, the, uh, uh, of the services. Uh, the present situation is one where uh, AT&T, of course, is the only carrier that provides long-distance service for anyone, any place in the country. 
Uh, it is the one that is regulated. It is the one that is prevented from introducing new services without uh, long litigation. Uh, it is the one that pays more than twice the price, the, the real economic cost for local access, uh, more than two times as much as its competitors, and must pass those costs on to the public in its prices. And so there are substantial numbers of consumers who have no choice but to use AT&T, uh, who pay the subsidies, the current subsidies from the unequal playing field, the fact that we pay more than twice as much for local access. We pay, we continue to pay the subsidy for local service that New England Telephone requires to keep into business, while our competitors uh, do not. And uh, that seems to be justified on the basis that uh, uh, that is necessary, otherwise the competition uh, cannot, uh, cannot survive. Um, the uh, comment about the eight-foot giant is also very, very uh, interesting uh, to me. Um, uh, we are a big company. Uh, uh, we're about uh, a fifth the size, someplace between a fifth and a quarter of the size that we were before divestiture. Among our competition are uh, uh, two-foot uh, midgets such as IBM and IT&T and uh, General Telephone and uh, GE and uh, McDonnell Douglas and uh, Ford Motor Company and uh, you know go on and uh, name all the, the people and you will find that many many of the companies in the Fortune 100 are either active players in the telecommunications industry uh, or uh, apparently will be, uh, will be rather, ra ra rather soon. Uh, the, real, the real question, it seems to me, is how is, the, how, how, how is the public best served? We have opted for a competitive environment in long distance telecommunication. The entry into that market is quite easy, quite easy. There are over 400 companies providing long-distance telecommunication service. They range all the way from small mom-and-pop kind of companies to the, to, to the Fortune 100 that I've, that I've talked about. Uh, it takes about a million dollars, 500,000 to a million dollars, to get into this business now as a, as, a, as a reseller. And there are a number of pretty big players who, who, uh, who, uh, who, who, who started uh, that way. Uh, the, uh, the consent decree, I think, was very, very effective in doing just exactly what, uh, what I, th I think Jeff was describing ought to be done, making entry really easy, uh, leveling the playing field as far as entry is concerned with regard to market power and, and so forth. And now the real question is, how do you bring the benefits of this to the, to the public? And in the present situation, AT&T, which I think has very important values to bring to the public in terms of lower prices, new services, and what have you, is the only player that is totally regulated. Uh, are we pressing for deregulation? You and I had this discussion before. Uh, I think the principal thing AT&T is arguing for is, you know, let, you know, let, the, 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 let the public decide how much regulation they want, but then regulate everybody the same way. And let competition work with whatever regulation is, uh, is, is, is necessary in order to serve whatever public, uh, uh, public needs uh, uh, must be served. That's not the situation we're in now, and as long as we are not in, the, in that situation, I don't think the public is well served. Well, I think as usual, the problem is uh, one of transitions and where those transitions might lead. Um, I think it's unrealistic to say that there's real competition now in the long distance, in the intercity long distance market. Clearly, there is more competition than there was before, um, but the extent of that competition, I think, can best be termed a bud, and we don't know if that bud is really going to grow and flower or, or not. And I, so I think some continued oversight from the Federal Communications Commission is, is important. There are some big players in, in the telephone competition market, but there are also um, many markets to be served. Um, recently, uh, New England Telephone Company notified interested long-distance carriers or potentially long-distance carriers that its uh, Burlington, Vermont switch would be available for equal access in 1985. The long distance carriers wrote back and said, gee, that's very, interested to, very interesting to us, but we're not interested in serving Burlington, Vermont until 1987. That's an indication to me that we don't have 
full and complete competition in the intercity market just yet, which isn't to contra contradict what Maury was saying. I, mean, I think there will be now, but it's going to take some time to grow, and the question is what regulatory safeguards do you have in the, w in, in the meantime? The other question, the longer-term question is, assuming competition does come up, what's it really going to look like in five or ten years? Are we going to have real competition or are we going to have an oligopoly? We're going to have three or four major carriers essentially fixing prices, not using that in the antitrust term, but basically doing that because there are only three or four carriers, or are there going to be many, many carriers? My guess at this point is you're leading to an oligopolistic system where you're going to have three or four major carriers, and at that point I think you're going to see increased public pressure to re-regulate those carriers to make sure that there isn't that kind of price fixing going on. I think you're witnessing uh, a normal operation of the American political system here with various ideologies and interests uh, painting stark pictures of competition versus monopoly, breaches of antitrust laws, uh, one thing or another, uh, as if there were, and then, you know, leading into specious sophist sophistries about pregnancy, uh, as if competition and monopoly were com comparable. Uh, and we hear, you know, pure, real competition. More. Folks, uh, only in economics textbooks do these things exist. They don't exist and never have existed and never will exist in the American economy. Uh, in my seminar this afternoon, I asked my class how many members had taken an economics course, and everyone raised their hands. I then asked how many had read Alfred Chandler's The Visible Hand, and nobody raised their hand. Uh, how many of you have read Alfred Chandler's The Visible Hand? A small, a small group. It won a Pulitzer Prize, you know. It's readable, which is not a crime. Uh, and oh yeah, you see that 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 that'll 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 help. You see that 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 helps with the, the notion of um, pure competition. Anyway, I commend those of you who uh, uh, have taken the trouble to listen to this this evening to go home and read Alfred Chandler. Uh, and see how over the existence of this republic uh, there have been uneasy compromises between competition, monopoly, this, that, and the other thing. And it's never been clean, and it's never going to be, and folks are going to tug one way uh, or the other, and you're, 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 you're witnessing uh, that kind of tugging. Uh, and regulation, regulation, what is regulation? Regulation of the administrative agency type is, after all, only something that was created in the late 19th century. The sense of the 18th century, a well-regulated commonwealth, well, it's always going to be, if they don't get you through the administrative agency, it'll be through the tax laws or something else. And somehow the notion that government will evaporate is fine for a Reagan speech, but it's not the reality. And uh, so, uh, uh, you know, I I it's... If you try to interpolate between the various extremist statements made around this table, maybe you can begin to sense where the equilibrium may or may not be. Uh, that's uh, well, my view as panelist, not as moderator. As moderator, do you have a follow-on question, or is this? Uh, no, thank you. you. No, thank <laughs> you very much. Good. Uh, I can't tell the camera from uh, a microphone. Is there somebody upstairs there? There's nobody upstairs. Is there a questioner downstairs? You certainly may ask a question, but you've got to come to the microphone, please. Your name My and name some... My name is Father Robert McEwen from Boston College, Sir. and I've been uh, interested in the telecommunications issue for many years. I want to ask Mr. Blumenfeld, if I hear him correctly, he punished AT&T for violations of antitrust laws. And as I hear the rest of the panel, it's, it sounds to me as if the ones getting punished are the consumers. Wasn't there a way of punishing AT&T without punishing all the rest of us the way we seem to be punished? I, I have a feeling that the theory behind, and correct me if this assumption is wrong, the theory behind the solution you proposed was that it was feasible, economically, politically, and, t and technologically feasible to separate telecommunications into a regulated half 
that would stay under regulation and be presumably the local level, and an unregulated half that would be sooner or later, hopefully, totally free. Now, I, I felt at the time that that theory in back of Judge Green and your consent decree was false, wrong, that it was never going to be feasible to have a local monopoly. And everything Mr. Coleman said implies that that's fast becoming true, that there, there's, there's very little of the local telecommunications that's going to remain a monopoly. If that's true, did you propose this on that false basis? Okay. Uh, the one of the ways that the decree has popularly and frequently been looked at is, is that it was punishment either to AT&T or, as some people put it, it was actually punishment to the BOCs when really AT&T was the bad guy. Uh, as I tried in my O2 brief opening statement uh, to indicate, the decree was not an attempt to punish anybody. What the decree was was an attempt to sever the incentive structure that had existed. That is, if you looked at the pre-divestiture AT&T, nobody was ever doing, any, doing anything evil by way of uh, their intent. What they were doing was being perfectly rational business people given the situation in which they found themselves, which is that they had a monopoly over local distribution of the telephone system, but they faced competition in the long distance market. The competition came in, as Maury said, because the techno technology made it virtually inevitable, or rather the technology presented an opportunity that entrepreneurs saw as inevitably attractive. And so competition began to appear, the possibility of competition. And where it began to appear was as competition for long lines, not initially as competition for the local company. Now, if you were in that business and you were facing competition in, your, in the long distance subsidiary, and you had a monopoly over the only way that your potential long distance competitors could get to their customers, there's a very simple and totally rational way to behave, which is you operate your local companies in such a way that your long distance competitors are prevented from reaching the customers in any meaningful way. Is that evil? Well, under the antitrust laws, it's something that certainly should be discouraged. But it's not evil in the sense that there were men sitting around in smoke-filled rooms chortling over it. It was a perfectly rational thing to do, given the way the business was structured. And it was that which the consent decree attempted to address by severing the structural relationship between what was then and what is in fact now and what will continue to be for some period of time a bottleneck monopoly. It was never a total monopoly. It's not a total monopoly now. It will become less total over the years, but gradually. It was an attempt to sever the nexus between that local monopoly and the areas of the business in which competition was appearing. Long distance, provision of equipment, terminal equipment to end users, and provision of telecommunications equipment to the companies themselves. Again, the local operating company officials, if they looked at those opportunities, the arrival, for instance, of MCI at their door with a blank check saying, how about some local access? A normal business person who is selling access would say, come right in, let me get you a cup of coffee, and let's talk numbers. The reaction instead was, unfortunately, that's technologically impossible to do, cannot be done. That's the first line defense. And so the, the decree was not an attempt to punish anybody. Okay, then the next question is, well, despite the fact that that wasn't the intent, is that what's happening? One of the notions that uh, Maury brought up is that uh, lo local rates have gone up inevitably. I happen to not believe in the theory that long distance subsidizes local, but that is the subject for at least an entire seminar class and is one of my favorites. I, can, I cannot go into it in any detail here. Suffice it to say that Judge Green was not persuaded on that one either. And if you read his opinion on the modified final judgment, he said there's a great deal of evidence to the contrary, and that is that local actually subsidized long distance, and it was certainly never demonstrated to be otherwise. Now, what, what about the widely predicted increase in local rates? Here's the situation. AT&T said repeatedly throughout the trial, if you break up the company, local rates will go up. That is a merchant telling you, if you do X, I'm going to raise my prices. So we did X, and guess what happened? They raised their prices. Now, what they would like you to believe is that 
price setting in the telephone system is a question of taking givens, taking economic truths out of the atmosphere and setting them down in their own inevitability on paper. That is not the way price setting works in the telecommunications system. In the real world, it much more resembles a Persian rug bazaar, uh, with no offense intended at all to Paul, than it does any rational economic process. The major problem being that nobody knows anything about the cost numbers except the company that's coming in and telling you that they're about to raise their prices. So the fact that the Bell system said, if you do that, I'm going to raise my prices, and then went right ahead and raised their prices, doesn't, to me, demonstrate that there was anything inherent in the nature of the universe that made those price increases inevitable. Instead, it was the system reacting. It was the local companies fearing that they were going to be faced with the beginnings of competition, raising their rates while they still had the monopoly. And the rates have gone up in the one area of the industry to which the decree did not introduce competition. In all other phases of the industry where competition has been introduced and where the possibility of competition now exists, the rates have gone down. So that alone should say something about what we should do, and I could not agree more with John, that what we should do is permit competition to seek its own level in this industry, including at the local level. And then we will see the same benefits of competition in local rates that we've seen elsewhere. Uh, one of the charms of separations of powers is that things happen in one branch of the government that would be impermissible in others. And uh, while uh, Jeff is correct, in saying that an analysis of the cost question would lead us far beyond this evening, uh, there's one point I think as moderator that I need to make, and his, which is that the notion that something was not demonstrated is a judicial concept. What I think Jeff means is that it was not demonstrated on the record as made in the courtroom. And legal and judicial truth is not the same as technical truth or economic truth or political truth. And as a consequence, what happened in that courtroom on the basis of the courtroom record as laid down under judiciary proceedings may have no relation whatsoever to reality as perceived outside the courtroom. And I caution you in hearing him uh, use the word demonstrate that he is not using it in a colloquial sense. Demonstration, then, if you look at the history of AT&T's competitive rate reductions over the 30 years that preceded divestiture, you'll find that the exception of a brief period in 1961 and 1962, there was never a period of time when AT&T had, in effect, a long-distance private line rate that the FCC had found to be lawful. And in every single case, the FCC found that they simply did not know enough about the cost information to be able to say whether the rates were justified, and therefore also did not know enough about the cost information to prescribe rates. Some truths are demonstrable. On the record of an administrative agency and a court, that is a long, long story, which goes... Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Any, uh, yes, my name is John Colstead, and uh, I come to the polls that Dr. Tannenbaum uh, missed, and believe me, you didn't. <laughs> uh, anyway, I ended up with the Communications Workers of America, and uh, I'm a temptation to ask about the fate of the million uh, employees, uh, many of... Um, of whom or are members of uh, our union. I would like to ask uh, any one of the panelists to comment on the issue of bypass, how uh, serious uh, an issue it, it really is. I think uh, Mr. Coleman touched on it in his opening remarks. Uh, the issue of bypass, the full and preciseness uh, of it, uh, I think the uh, bypass uh, probably continue. Um, and will continue at a uh, faster rate unless several things happen. End use, uh, which was uh, affected by the uh, healthy line business last year, which uses all as pro line, and the residential uses in June of $35, that will also go to $2. Uh, to that extent, uh, a uh, surcharge that was been, has been built in surcharge so that the residential rate could go up by $2.35. Those are some people that will hold back bypass. But if uh, the economic quality bypass, bypass will still continue. Uh, technology, I think, will push it. Our companies today in Boston, and especially Web Belt, that want to have uh, their own privacy, uh, for what it not, uh, bypass, uh, for as an example, Wang Laboratories has their own system. 
cable company. Uh, most of the city is being cable. Uh, there are companies in the city that can point, point in uh, the fiber optic system uh, at a much at a very low rate. It's not an average rate. It's just the cost between two buildings. So I think bypass to minimized but it will continue and uh, a concern for customers. This is an interesting question because it also gets to competition, is there? Um, it's that not all the competition comes from regulated companies, unregulated companies. The area of bypass that I've seen basically want to put in private line networks. They can't get what they want from the local operating company or maybe the ladder lines from. And yet I see no reaction from the part of the operating companies or to compete for that private line business. And I see the same continuation of pricing, not trying to meet it. And it makes you wonder how much the operating companies and at and are in market. Um, in addition, you try to meet the competition with the price. But I see virtually no action in that area um, by local operating companies in, in the most, most vulnerable area. You start to wonder how serious they are. Uh, could I comment? Uh, maybe it's worth a minute what bypass is and maybe talk about that. And let me say, I, I really, I, I've looked at people going up on poles. <laughs> when I was younger, I wanted to do it, but my mother wouldn't let me. Um, a bypass really, I think, is probably one of the real-life uh, demonstrations of, uh, of the fact that uh, Jeff was talking about perhaps was not demonstrated in, in, uh, in court. Uh, namely, that the local service does is subsidized by a long distance uh, uh, service. Uh, the um, in 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 the present environment, as an inter exchange uh, carrier, I'm telling that the long distance facilities are customers, and uh, I go to the local companies and I get the last few miles on each end to connect to my uh, uh, to my customer. for divestiture. We all did that together. We got to know and end to end. Uh, local companies, of course, charge me for that connection. And uh, what they charge uh, for um, that connection, if I'm going to use it for a long uh, kind, kind of service, to our knowledge, our technical and economic knowledge, uh, something in the neighborhood of 300% more than the, than the call that, uh, based upon uh, an allocation. See, those, those, those facilities are used for local service and for long, and so you have to decide how you want to allocate that cost. If you were to hit it just on the basis of the percentage of time they're used for those two services, I, uh, I pay about uh, 330 per minute more to use that circuit for a minute. Someone making a local call pays uh, to, uh, to use it uh, for a minute. Uh, uh, not that it costs the local company, but it's also more than a party would have to pay if he makes a lot of long calls. If he went out and bought his own facilities, bought a mic up or put up a satellite antenna or used all the various new tech that he could uh, in order either to carry his call or to reach a long distance carrier. Uh, that uh, that was there. Now, th th this occurred over the years uh, in order to keep the the local service low, lower would would otherwise be if you allocated those costs to some of uh, uh, of usage, and that's the subsidy we talk about. And bypass is simply the economic incentive of lots of people who are heavy users of long distance service who see that they can now build and and possibly local telephone companies because of the high cost of local com telephone companies attribute to that. If the local telephone companies attributed to that only their true economic cost, they could pri price access much lower and it would not be nearly as attractive for people to, uh, uh, to bypass. On the other hand, they'd have the problem then of how do they cover their total costs. And the only way to cover their total cost is to bring the cost of local the use of those same that's those same circuits for local use to bring it up to a to a level more directly related uh, to the percentage of time uh, that uh, uh, that that they are that they are used. Um, bypass is principally a, a threat to the local telephone companies, and and I think John can speak much more authoritatively than than I can now about that. I can tell you though, at a time when I was uh, um, uh, at least partially responsible for John's company as well as, as well as my own. I considered bypass a very large threat uh, to that local distribution and a very major reason why it was so important uh, to reduce this subsidy that we are currently forcing long distance users to pay because the really big heavy users can find technological ways to get around that and it, 
if they do that, of course, they take their revenues, the revenues that were helping to support the, local, the cost of local service away. They abandon facilities that the telephone companies have anyway, in which they already have sunk investment. The telephone companies are forced then to try to recover those costs someplace else, and the only place else they have to cover them, recover them really, is for the people who are still on the network. The people who can't afford to bypass. Who are the people that can't afford to bypass? The people that don't make a lot of distance calls. And who is that? A large percentage of the local residential telephone user. So that's why it's, I think it is so important, particularly for the local companies, uh, to find other ways to recover those costs so they can price their distribution, their local facilities, to AT&T and all the other inter-exchange carriers at truly competitive economic costs. Uh, Paul, to your, to your point, uh, uh, and I guess I'm not sure just exactly uh, what's going on here, uh, but a number of the uh, local telephone companies, I guess one of the uh, Pacific, for example, is before their commission now asking for very major reductions in the costs that they want to charge uh, exchange carriers for local access facilities because, because they recognize this. At the same time, they're taking the risk that they have to find another place to get those costs back. This, uh, we are running out of time. I'd like to recognize two more questions, which I hope will be brief, and the re replies to them brief. For those of you who are held in suspense by this argument about where the costs lie, may I interpolate a brief advertisement. Uh, excruciating details will be delivered in the next fall, as they have in the past fall, in General Education 156, available also through cross-registration at Kennedy School as S486, my course, of course, uh, <laughs> in which uh, all of this is dealt with in excruciating uh, detail. But that, we don't have time for that this evening. Another question. I'm Hendrik Houtak, a professor of economics at this university. I would like to take uh, issue with the chairman who has presented uh, the alternation between regulation and deregulation as largely a question of fashion. I would say it is more than that. The present deregulation came about for slightly accidental reasons, although not entirely accidental. And I believe that now that deregulation has started, it is irreversible for a considerable period of time to come. There is a great deal of technology. Mr. Coleman has mentioned some of it, say embodied in cable TV, in, in, in the satellite dishes, which you see everywhere in the countryside, which are not there only to receive dirty movies. They, they, they can be used for, for, for many other purposes as well. Um, uh, the microcomputers, which are now by the millions in, in businesses and, and homes, are very sophisticated communications instruments as well as being useful for word processing and, and whatnot. Uh, the, the consequences of this are only just beginning to be realized. And therefore, competition, once this started, is not going to, to be reversed very soon. The one thing, and, 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 and here I'm asking a, a question whether you would agree that the one thing that, 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 that will bring deregulation to a halt is widespread losses among the suppliers of telephone services. For instance, I, I would not make the same statement about the airlines because in the airlines we may be seeing widespread losses. So widespread that Congress will actually do something to restore the previous situation. I believe in the telephone industry we are not seeing that right now and therefore we will see a continuing development towards newer forms of, of communications which will occupy the rest of this century. Hank, uh, that's re uh, all I will limit myself to saying is that the last guy who said that was our n late colleague from the economics department, Arthur Holcomb, who in 1911 uh, wrote uh, about how competition in the telephone system was to be forever. And seven years later, the Willis Graham Act was passed, uh, which set up the regime of uh, sort of monopolistic thing, which was recently blown up. Now, we can argue about when the pendulum will swing, but who knows about inevitability. May I recognize the lady up there, please? My name is Philomena Lupo, and I'm with the Rhode Island Judicial Systems and Sciences. And my question is how competition and equal access would be uh, achieved on public telephones. Would the, would the operating company submit a bid, and would the uh, long-distance service go to one company, or would the people on whose premises the public telephone is located purchase the telephone and choose the service? How would you assure equal access in that area? All of the above. 
There, there is already competition in, in public telephones in lots of places. One of the nicest things that happened to me after the vesture was escaping from Washington momentarily. I was in Denver speaking at a U.S. West group. And when I got to the airport uh, in Denver, I walked up to a payphone uh, at the airport to find that by pushing one of four buttons at the bottom of the phone, I could achieve access uh, to one of the four long-distance companies that provided service uh, at, to Stapleton Airport, to the Denver area. That was done by the local telephone company, Mountain Bell. Uh, so that's one of the yeah. possibilities, and that's already in place, in, in not just at Stapleton, but in uh, more and more places, such as airports around the country. And that exists a, a today at Logan Airport. At yeah. Logan Airport, there are various types of coin telephones, but one has uh, one machine, or one type machine, has uh, six or seven different interstate vendors, and you choose the vendor of your choice, and at the same time, you can use a, a master charger or Visa card at the same time in this particular type station. And in a number of states, uh, the states have uh, authorized people to, uh, in the independent part, private parties, to buy uh, public pay, pay phones and install them and let the public use them. And uh, they collect uh, the coins and then they pay the telephone company for whatever charges are incurred. So I think the right answer, John, is all of the above. <laughs> Well, I'd like to close by thanking you, the audience, for your patient interest, the questioners for asking interesting questions, most of them to the point, and the panel uh, for bearing up with my uh, somewhat interventionist chairing, chairing and for coming to spend the time with us. We are grateful to you on behalf of the Institute of Politics, the university, and the whole audience. Thank you very much. Thank you.